everyone. Um, welcome to the first panel of CMRC. Uh, this is challenges to security in space. So I am Nicholas Martin. I'll be the moderator today. And before I introduce our panelists, we will, uh, I'll kind of go over the general format for this panel. So each panelist here will give a short 15 minute uh, presentation on that they've prepared beforehand. And then after that, we will open things up to a Q and A for the audience. So um, for audience members, if you look at the bottom, middle bottom of your screen, there's a Q and A section that we can use after all panelists have finished their presentations. So yeah, the, our first panel will cover the barriers the US faces with maintaining and expanding current space operations and the importance of securing space-based services. We will also discuss foreign threats to American space operations and their impact on military, commercial, and civil sectors. Our first speaker joining us today is Dr. David Burback, Associate Professor of National Security Affairs at the US Naval War College. Dr. Burback's scholarly interests include civil military relations, defense planning, and the relationship between international security and technology, particularly with regards to space and nuclear policy. We are also joined by Dr. Damon Coletta, Associate Director at USAFA's Eisenhower Center for Space and Defense Studies. Dr. Coletta also edits the Eisenhower peer-reviewed journal, Space and Defense, and recently completed a book on technology and international security. And our final speaker is Dr. Everett Dolman, Professor of Comparative Military Studies at the US Air Force's Air Command and Staff College. Dr. Dolman began his career at the National Security Agency as an intelligence analyst and also has experience at the United States Space Command. So without further ado, I, we can go to our first speaker, Dr. Burback. Okay, we should be on a uh, screen share now. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for your interest and for joining the conference today. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, and uh, I'll, I did uh, I, I did watch uh, Mr. Szymanski's presentation just before, so I'll try not to cover any of the, the same ground as him. But I'd like to in some ways step back a little bit and just ask, what is really new in space security? You know, why why are we uh, have have concerns gone up so much? What some of the reasons behind creating space for us? Um, and if you look at some of the U.S. strategic statements, whether from the Obama administration or from the Trump administration, um, there's there's been a concern expressed that as uh, as our space strategy about just under 10 years ago put it uh, that space is becoming increasingly congested contested and competitive uh, the Trump administration phrased that as competitors are turning space into a war fighting domain and what do we mean by that and what are the implications because in in some ways um, space really isn't all that new um, space is uh, space. You know, we have been operating in space longer than I've been alive. Certainly, longer than any of you students have been alive. Uh, it's been now more than sixty years since the first satellite. Uh, you know, and in fact, SpaceX just put another. Uh, sorry, uh, the United Launch Alliance just put another U.S. military satellite in space yesterday. Um, so this is there's really nothing new. And even if you go back to the early Cold War, within just a few years after. Sputnik. We had spy satellites. We had nav military navigational satellites. We had anti-satellite weapons operating within just five years after Sputnik was launched. Uh, we even tested nuclear weapons in space. So what you see there is not a romantic shot of the moon, but is actually a uh, about a one megaton nuclear warhead a few hundred miles away from Hawaii lighting up the skies over Honolulu. Um, so space has been militarized in a sense for a long time, but there are a few Few things that that are uh, causing us to to have new concerns and raising the stakes, and you know I would summarize the the two biggest changes that from those early Cold War days is that space is now in everything, civil and military. Um, it's in all sorts of civilian and military technologies such that we're dependent upon space um, in a much deeper way than we were 50 years ago. Um, the other thing that has been a change is geopolitical as opposed to technological. 
that great power competition has returned, as opposed to our focus after the end of the Cold War on relatively uh, relatively weak rogue states like uh, Iraq or Serbia um, or terrorist groups like Al Qaeda. Uh, we're again concerned about competition and potential conflict with countries like Russia or China that are really quite capable across the board, including in space. And the rise of China in particular as a space power has changed things. So what do I mean by spaces and everything? I mean, I, I, given our, our time is limited, I won't try and go through sort of all the ways that it affects your daily lives. Um, but you're, you know, you've all grown up, uh, you know, w in a world where GPS is widely available. Um, everybody has, nobody gets lost. Everybody has a map available. Um, in addition to GPS, your cell phones to, for positioning, your cell phones themselves depend on timing signals from space. If you take out the GPS satellites, the whole cell cell phone network crashes. Uh, similar for the banking system. Uh, you know, the role of weather satellites, uh, communication satellites, tracking airplanes and ships from space. Um, for all sorts of civilian applications, our modern digital economy relies on our on our space assets, including government satellites like the, uh, the GPS constellation. At a military level, um, that's become even more true. Uh, and just as you depend on space-enabled technology for navigating and communicating, so does the military, all the way down to a tactical level. You can see a Marine there on a small satellite phone. Whereas in the 1960s, we needed space for strategic-level nuclear operations. We used spy satellites to see where the Russian ICBMs were. Um, you know, the those initial navigation satellites were used so that our nuclear submarines would know where they were when they launched a missile. Um, we now use space in every day, all the way down to the individual soldier, sailor, and marine tactical level. Um, the slide you see at the lower left, I'm not going to try and go through that. You saw a slide similar to that from uh, from Paul's keynote speech. Um, DoD is full of PowerPoint showing lots of satellites and lines and diagrams. But the general point is our whole way of warfare is enabled by um, a dense network of communication satellites, uh, reconnaissance and uh, intelligence satellites, imaging satellites, navigational and timing satellites. Um, we've, we've developed a very technological way of warfare in the United States. And you know, through, across the board, that depends on space technology. And the, the, the globe that you see there in the lower right is to highlight the fact that in one of the more likely conflicts that we now worry about, if we were to get into a conflict with China in the East China, South China Sea, or, or otherwise Western Pacific, is that we're operating a long, long way from the United States across huge expanses of water that will absolutely depend on satellite communication, satellite reconnaissance, satellite navigation, um, whereas uh, the Chinese would be operating much closer to their own shores. You can imagine if the U.S. were fighting a war in the Gulf of Mexico, um, their communications lines and their ability to know what's going on nearby is not so space dependent. Um, it's certainly, they have their own space assets and it helps, but if we're fighting a war so far away from our own shores, we're going to be absolutely, it'll be absolutely critical to have a space network that supports operating across the Pacific Ocean. Well, and again, as I mentioned, the, the other big changes we do now imagine that we might need to uh, to be able to compete and potentially win wars uh, against China or Russia again. Capable space powers. Uh, the Russians recently have done some tests, not not blowing anything up and creating debris, but tests of an anti-satellite missile system. Uh, they've long been a capable power in space. Uh, China got a much later start in the Cold War. They were not really very active in space until the 1980s, uh, but they've been catching up quickly. There's now a Chinese equivalent of the GPS constellation. China has military reconnaissance and communication satellites. China has tested an anti-satellite weapon a little over a decade ago, uh, probably has tried to use lasers to blind U.S. reconnaissance satellites, uh, jamming capabilities. You know, they're, they're capable you know, near-peer powers in a way that we haven't faced since the end of the Cold War. So what, it, what does that all mean? And here, uh, a concept, some of you may have taken some international relations courses and seen this idea, um, and Paul Szymanski's presentation highlighted this as well, but one, one worry in space 
is that it really leads to something we call a security dilemma, where it's very it's difficult for countries to feel secure, which can lead to incentives to strike first, to engage in arms races, to be very fearful and unstable. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is that space technology tends to be extremely dual use. Uh, you may know that SpaceX will be launching another uh, human uh, crewed capsule to the International Space Station tomorrow on their Falcon 9. They also use the Falcon 9 to launch U.S. military satellites. It's exactly the same technology. Uh, the Chinese used a heavy lift booster that they recently developed to send a probe to Mars this summer. Uh, they'll use the same uh, booster to launch heavy military satellites. Um, if you can guide a satellite into orbit, you can guide an ICBM to its destination. You can guide an anti-satellite weapon. If you have learned how to make clever little, and this is the uh, the middle graphic you see there, is a, uh, m- uh, a concept of a Northrop Grumman satellite docking with a communications satellite to refuel it. Well, if you can dock with a satellite to refuel it, you could also, you know, James Bond style, have an arm reach out and cut off the solar panel or spray paint the sensor, or just give it a big whack and disable it. Um, Very similar technology. Or in the bottom you see pointing up the Hubble Space Telescope, pointing down a CIA reconnaissance satellite. More or less the same space telescope technology differing in whether they point up or down. So if there's really no way for a country like China or Russia to have good space capabilities and not potentially pose a military threat, let alone the actual military systems we see them developing. Uh, and as Paul discussed, um, it's pretty easy. Whoever strikes first is probably going to win. Uh, satellites are pretty easy to attack. You know where they're going to be. I mean, we can compute weeks in advance when two satellites might collide, something that we've seen happen a few times. Um, they're not very hard to track. You can try to make satellites stealthy, but overall, they're you know they're they're up there uh, and their positions are pretty knowable. Uh, they're pretty fragile. I mean, you can't make a satellite armored like a tank. Uh, it'd be too heavy. Uh, you can't have it bristling with defensive weapon systems, or as uh, Paul Szymanski explained, even if you shoot at an incoming interceptor, the chunks of it are still going to be coming at you at several miles per second, and it may not help very much. So it's really hard to defend satellites. Um, and then at a broader level, space itself is surprisingly fragile. Uh, we learned from those early Cold War nuclear tests that if you set off a nuclear weapon in space, you fill space with radiation belts. That test over Hawaii actually knocked out the very first test communicate television uh, relay satellite that AT&T had launched uh, a little earlier that year. Um, we learned pretty quickly that if you tried to have a nuclear war in space to take out enemy satellites, you'd kill everybody's satellites pretty quickly. Um, a little less dramatically, a little slower, but if you fill space with debris from blowing up satellites, you also will pose a threat to everyone's satellites pretty quickly. Uh, many of you may have seen the uh, the movie Gravity uh, a few years ago. They talked about the Kessler syndrome where you know one satellite gets destroyed and then that breaks up other satellites and soon you know debris is killing everything. Um, yeah, the movie was was kind of dr- was dramatized, but there is actually a real point here. and you can see in the lower right, uh, I hi- highlighted the Feng Yun anti-satellite test in 2007. One test of blowing up one satellite caused a massive increase in the total amount of debris in space. So it really wouldn't take much of a space war to, to render the whole environment unusable. So you put all that together, and we have, again, what we call this security dilemma, where anybody's space capability can look pretty threatening even if they don't even if their intent is defensive even if they have mostly civilian capabilities um that leads to a natural uh uh, counter reaction and then counter counter reactions and pretty soon you're spiraling into a space arms race uh with a lot of incentive to strike first if you fear that war is coming and the fact that the U.S. has this asymmetric dependence because we're fighting so far away and have such a space-enabled way of warfare, um, that really increases the stakes, both for potential adversaries to want to take out U.S. capabilities. And we have to fear that you know even, even if we're the clear number one in space, because of that offense dominance, um, even a number two power in space could take away our space advantages pretty quickly, and it would be very hard to stop that. So that, that underlies 
a, a lot of the worries about this new technology and new geopolitical competition in space. So, you know, last slide here. What where's this going to lead? And you sometimes see American space uh, leaders saying that we we want dominance, we want nobody to be able to threaten us in space. Um, that's going to be almost impossible to achieve. If the standard is if the standard is nobody should be able to threaten us in space, you almost are led to we would have to blow up everybody's launch sites and everybody's existing satellites first because um, it's almost impossible to achieve that kind of invulnerability. Well, so then what do we do? Um, you know, we may try and chase that spiral, that security dilemma, and try. Um, the Chinese or the Russians might put us in a position where we don't have much choice. Um, we can learn to live with a certain amount of vulnerability. We can figure out, and this, this is something we're absolutely doing, how to make our space assets, how to make our way of fighting more resilient. So if we lose some satellites, um, how do we keep on fighting? Instead of relying on a few big, expensive satellites, maybe we kind of go the SpaceX direction and start launching thousands of small, cheap satellites, and that's a lot harder to take out. Uh, in the Cold War, the uh, the U.S. and the Soviets actually both did come to realize that, you know, given all this instability, given how quickly you would degrade the space environment, um, that we actually both showed some restraint and used space for relatively passive purposes, uh, reconnaissance, communication, navigation. Um, but we stayed away from the worst kind of arms race or, or worst kind of offensive concepts. And maybe we can achieve that again. But you know, we, we are now kind of moving out of a period of US dominance and being able to think of space as something of a sanctuary and having to think about what a new era of geopolitical competition with space peers looks like. So uh, let, me, let me stop there. Stop my screen share, and uh, after uh, we hear from uh, uh, our other two speakers, look forward to any questions. Thank you, Dr. Burbeck. Um, so now we'll be moving on to Dr. Damon Coletta. So um, if you have any presentation ready, you can go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. I think I'll, what I'll do is I'll lay out uh, three questions that uh, we've been seeing uh, at the Eisenhower Center and at the uh, Journal for Space and Defense. And it does uh, go along the lines of what uh, Paul Szymanski and Dr. Burbach were, were talking about. Uh, we started the center uh, during the uh, second Bush administration. So it's been about 15 years and in the left excuse me, in the last 10 years, we've had um, several articles that have um, nibbled around the edges of questions that are becoming more and more common. So Dr. Burbach just spoke about the uh, security dilemma, and we've had several folks uh, try to unpack the problems of deterrence uh, as they relate to the space domain. So we'd call this first topic, uh, new thinking on deterrence. The, the old thinking on deterrence comes from the Cold War and nuclear weapons. And if the, the basic idea there is that you're involved in a game of chicken with the adversary, neither side wants to uh, escalate to a, uh, a general nuclear exchange, uh, but at the same time, they want to defend their interests. Um, the, the idea of new thinking on deterrence comes comes from the fact that the first attack might not even be kinetic. And so the idea that a defender like the United States would respond with some sort of uh, nuclear strike seems disproportionate and not very credible. So if we are still very interested, particularly if the United States is one of the more vulnerable actors in this resurgent great power competition, how do we deter attacks against our assets in space that we've become more and more upon which we become more and more dependent. Uh, so one of the ideas that's come up is this notion of layered deterrence. And uh, Dr. Szymanski had talked about the difficulties with space law. Um, that has come up in the journal and the journal articles as well. And the idea is that even if you can't enforce it in every case, having uh, rules of the road, if not, if not space law, uh, confidence building measures and rules of the road, they can act like a plate glass window. So if you can monitor well enough, if you have, if you have good enough uh, space situational awareness, 
that could be the plate glass window so that when the adversary breaks the window, that's a first signal that your relationship is moving uh, into a different place. So, um, and then what would be the next layer in layer deterrence? So trying to figure out uh, what would be a proportional response well below the idea of a, of a nuclear exchange. So do you need, does it need to be symmetric or could there be an asymmetric response? You remember the, the story that uh, Dr. Szymanski was telling you about the Russian response to uh, the attack that he suspected on their, their satellites. It was a cyber response, it was an asymmetric response. So as you go through these different layers way before you get to um, the result of a chicken game or mutual assured destruction, there are many places where you can think about uh, trying to stop the damage and discourage, discourage aggression. Um, the, other, it, the other idea that's come out um, that if anybody who's interested in doing research in these areas is probably going to run into is the notion of uh, cross-domain deterrence. And it's related to layer deterrence because you have all these other um, activities that are involved in delaying an attack on your space assets. Um, the difficulty there is that the governments are set up so that you have specialists in each of these areas, in each of these domains. And so you have space force, you have a new bu bureaucracy which will specialize in the space domain, but they're going to have to work very closely if we're going to attempt layer deterrence or cross domain deterrence. They're gonna to have to learn how to work very closely with partners. And, it, and if you think about uh, the situation in Iraq and the idea of a whole of government approach, you're gonna have similar problems just with dealing uh, with space deterrence. Um, so there's a lot of new thinking going on in deterrence, trying to figure this out. The second question that I would like to put on the table for the Q&A is related to, again, to what Dr. Burbach was saying about the resurgence of great power competition. You have, and what he said about spaces and everything, you have the resurgence of great power competition at the same time that you have the opportunity for high levels of cooperation through the provision of public goods. So what, what do I mean by public goods? These uh, be benefit folks who haven't necessarily paid for the goods and there, it is difficult, let's say, it is difficult to exclude people who haven't paid uh, to play. So an example of uh, public goods or potential public goods would be uh, GPS. Now, it is possible to exclude others from GPS, but if there's a norm that uh, other countries and companies that are headquartered in other countries can go ahead and use these services, that approaches the idea of a utility or a public good. So uh, navigation and timing, uh, space, situa space situational awareness, which is important for private companies because they have to pay insurance in order to uh, launch and, and operate their satellites. And so space situa situational awareness is an important thing, but the capability to provide that is very asymmetric. In fact, the US government is one of the uh, premier, pr premier providers of that. Um, the idea of manned exploration. Manned exploration, uh, manned missions in space are far more expensive because you have to keep the crew alive. Uh, so in, in terms of defraying some of those extra costs, that could be a, a potential public good. And then in more of the realm of science fiction uh, and, and movies, talking about protection from asteroids, whether that could be uh, a potential for uh, global cooperation, asteroid mining, which again, in, in the realm of science fiction, they're thinking about the possibility there, the possibility there and the idea of energy production from space. So this is technology that's further out, but it just, people are thinking about it, showing the potential for cooperation. Again, you have the potential for public goods and greater cooperation at the same time that you have the resurgence of great power, uh, great power competition. And uh, Dr. Burbach has, has laid out some of the ideas that we're seeing in the journal on great power competition. The idea of military advantage being uh, independent of military vulnerability. So it's possible to have military advantage at the same time that you are more vulnerable than your adversary. And that does make space dominance uh, a difficult idea. Um, there's been a lot of interest 
in during this resurgence of great power competition in looking at the strategic culture. So we had an article uh, in the last issue that was looking at China's, uh, the Chinese Communist Party's view of Marxism and how that would influence their strategic culture uh, and their approach to uh, United States assets and United States competition uh, in space. So just like during the Cold War, there was a lot of interest in how the Russians and Russian strategic culture would deal with, with, uh, with military problems. That's, we see that same idea coming back in with the resurgence of great power competition. So I've, I've, I've given you two themes so far and in the few minutes that I have left, um, but just to remind you, the new thinking on deterrence is one idea that we're seeing. The other one is this balance between the potential for public goods, a space-based public goods on the one hand and the resurgence of great power competition on the other. The last thing in honor of allies tradition that I'd like to uh, lay out there is what how will ideas about civil military relations, that's the allies tradition, how will ideas about civil military relations relate to uh, changes in how we address space, particularly the idea of the new space force? And for this one, we haven't had a whole lot of articles, but you saw at the very end of uh, Dr. Szymanski's presentation, um, his concern about um, whether the Space Force is prepared to deal with the problems that are uh, coming ahead, that they haven't had the experience of uh, being pressed. I, I might uh, push back a little bit on that. I think the Air Force has had um, uh, experiences that caused them to learn lessons, formative experiences. I think we could, we could talk about the Berlin Airlift. I think we could talk about the, um, the post-Sputnik era, the post-Sputnik year, 1957, 1958, when the United States was behind in the space race. So there, there have been those formative experiences, but I, I would agree with him that at least at the unclassified level, uh, we haven't had that formative experience for the Space Force. Those formative experiences may be very important for uh, developing professionalism uh, in a new service. And professionalism in democracy is key to working together with civilian authority, with political authority. Um, because it, to the extent that the president under the oversight of Congress needs to make decisions in a space crisis or in the opening stages of a space war, the professional development of that space force may be very important because they will be responsible for providing full frank expert advice to the president so that the United States as a democracy can navigate any crisis. So I will stop there. The, uh, what I put on the table for you, I'll hand it over to uh, Professor Dolman, but the idea of new thinking on deterrence, public goods, the potential for public goods rising at the same time as you have the resurgence of great power competition and new problems in civil military relations with the professionalization of the Space Force. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Coletta. Um, now we'll hear for, from our last panelist, uh, Dr. Everett Dolman. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, uh, Damon and David. I, I really appreciate that. I'm gonna go through this. I built some slides just in case I ran out of things to talk about. I have plenty of, plenty of stuff on here, but I get to go through it pretty quickly because of the presentations that you've given already. Um, we start with the, the idea that uh, space is important. That's been going on uh, already. It'll go on for the rest of this. Uh, uh, this meeting, of course, but no nation relies on space more for its physical security and its economic well-being than does the United States. I work for the United States Air Force and the United States Space Force, and so um, this is what concerns me primarily, is fighting a war in space. The first thing that we need to do to make sure that that uh, is understood is to, un is to uh, see space not as, as systems and satellites, things that give us all, all that we need, but think of space as infrastructure. Uh, we've had a lot of people talking here about uh, uh, how much value we get out of it. Let me just get to the, you know, from farming to just-in-time supply, supply to Uber and Lyft uh, to uh, secure transactions. Just let me get to the apocalyptic for you. If we were to lose space completely, your smartphones would not work. Um, the U.S. military and uh, 
Most modern militaries require space support in order to operate effectively. In fact, uh, today it's uh, over 70% of the weapons that the army uses are space enabled. That means they don't work effectively or even at all without space support uh, within them. If we were to lose space for the United States military, we would be unable to carry effective missions out abroad. We'd probably have to go into an immediate defensive crouch. And if we could not get space back, we would have to resort to ginning up a Vietnam era, early Vietnam era form of military force, and that could take years. Um, I mentioned being a, a working for the folks that uh, are supposed to defend space. Uh, the United States Air Force is responsible for guaranteeing access to space for everyone in times of peace and ensuring no opposing force can access space in conflict and war. This is very similar to the mission that the US Navy has uh, on the open ocean. Space is a common area like that. Uh, uh, up until now, however, the US military has been deprived of using weapons to do that, which makes it a very difficult uh, job. The US military is a martial organization. Uh, their purpose is to be prepared and when called upon to fight the nation's battles. Um, I'm going to go a little bit into domain theory. It's something I've been working on quite a bit as of late. Uh, for every area of conflict that has developed historically from land, sea, air, and space, uh, each one has developed, uh, based on their operating uh, characteristics, a different way of thinking about fighting, whether it's sailing or ramming for the seas, whether it's um, um, uh, mustering forces, getting them into the air for long enough at the right time and place for the air, uh, or whether it's understanding the, the importance of orbital mechanics uh, and, and delta V or change in maneuver as it is for space and possibly even for cyber at some point with uh, virtual space. Uh, when it's recognized that uh, a war fighting domain has, been, uh, has come into place, a service organization normally goes into responding for that. Space Force is being created now, not because it's ready to fight, not because it's proven itself as fighting, uh, but because until you get a Space Force, no one's gonna think about the purpose of military forces in domain, and that is that command of the domain is job one. The purpose of military is to control or command the domain, and that, uh, and if you cannot control or command the domain, uh, then you have to ensure that an opponent cannot get command of that domain, and that is called contestation. Uh, contestation is possible from an adjacent uh, domain. Uh, command is only possible from within the domain. And for example, uh, we've talked a lot about uh, folks uh, targeting space uh, uh, with weaponry from the earth. Uh, that, that means that they can prevent access to that domain. We see it with the army and their ground to uh, air capabilities and missiles that prevents the enemy's air forces from flying over the top. But just because you can prevent someone else from accessing the domain doesn't mean they can't uh, keep you from accessing uh, the domain as well. The only way you can command it is if you can operate in the domain. And the reason you need to operate in the domain is to be able to uh, uh, generate military effects from that domain, to be able to contest adjacent domain and to use it. Uh, you must be prepared if you're looking at it from a military perspective to operate in the domain, to fight in the domain and fight from the domain. And that means to generate effect from the domain. Um, we generate those effects uh, in the Air Force, uh, say for example, humanitarian aid is delivered or a bomb is delivered to a target, those are effects. That is not the purpose of the Air Force to do those things. The purpose is to be able to get into the air and then the effects it can generate it are limited only by the imagination. Uh, uh, for example, bombing a factory is not called uh, economic warfare. Uh, some might call it that, but in a military uh, jargon, it, it is air power having an effect on the ground. Uh, we wouldn't call bombing a school educational warfare and we shouldn't be bombing schools anyway. This gives us some real problems, however, with deterrence. And one of the things that's happening now is the idea that we can deter uh, uh, nefarious actors from affecting us in the space domain by cross-domain deterrence or by other methods that in fact, some would say, uh, hey, if somebody attacks one of our satellites, that's our national sovereignty and we reserve the right to go ahead and drop a bomb on them where they live. Uh, but is that really a credible deterrent threat? Would we, the United States or any other country uh, if a satellite suddenly goes inactive, decide to bomb the person we, a nation we thought that uh, had done that. Would we uh, lay down a fire barrage on Shanghai, for example? I doubt it. I doubt it very much, and I don't think we should be thinking that way. 
So when deterrence uh, doesn't work, when deterrence fails, we need to uh, defend those assets. And is war in space likely? Um, probably not. Um, well, not in the near term. In the long term, the Chinese think it's inevitable. And the basic reason for that is we, what we consider confidence building measures uh, are not necessarily confidence building measures. We mirror image. For example, in the United States, we think if we have a transparent uh, capability from space that we can see into China, for example, that we can see if they are marshalling, getting ready for an attack. We can see if they're uh, in Russia, if they're uh, abiding by treaties. And this gives us great confidence. It does not give the Chinese great confidence. The idea that we can see what they're doing is very much against the cultural attitude uh, going all the way back to Sun Tzu and the Lao Tzu, that when the enemy can see you and knows what you're doing, they can defeat you in detail. Uh, the Russians have a very similar sort of attitude that never let the world know how strong or how weak you are because that will uh, hurt you in the long run. Um, we have fought in space and we fought around space. Um, I'm gonna just bring up, um, we've been doing it for a long time or thinking about it. One of those thoughts were the Star Wars or SDI program from the 1980s, which was uh, the idea that we could put a perfect shield uh, over the world um, with uh, a anti-ballistic missile system. Uh, the idea that we could defeat nuclear war from space was one that was brought up in the 1980s. It was a little problematic. At the time, uh, the United States and Soviet Union had over 60,000 nuclear warheads uh, between them. And even if a, a system could be um, developed that would uh, defeat 99% of those, that's still 600 getting through in life as we know it on this planet, which was very different if that should happen. The problem was, and this is where deterrence also has a, has a huge uh, issue, and it was, uh, SDI was uh, extended into the Bush administration because the most, uh, the least likely scenario, the least likely thing that was going to happen was a massive nuclear strike from the Soviet Union to the United States or vice versa. Our uh, ability to uh, have a guaranteed second strike that seemed to be uh, keeping the peace. The problem with deterrence is that when it fails, it fails utterly. And the real problem too, is there are things that cannot be deterred. The Bush administration's most likely scenarios but there was that there might be an accidental launch. How do we make sure that an accidental launch doesn't reach its target? A rogue state strike, uh, others have talked about these, terrorist and non-state -state actors. This is primarily an issue of attribution. Uh, something we call the mad, mad boat captain, the hunt for red October scenario or the Strange, Dr. Strange scenario. And the big one was third party warfare. What if uh, Pakistan were to, to launch a nuke at India or vice versa, Iran at Israel or vice versa, and North Korea launching war in the tents that lands in Japan? How could we deter that or stop that? We, when deterrence fails, we must defend. The idea was uh, we would have 350 or so kinetic kill vehicles circling the earth, uh, each one uh, with about 24 shots on it. The, to, to take advantage of the fact that space has a global, it is inherently global by nature. Uh, under the Bush administration, it was, it was estimated that if a system like this could be put into effect, it could stop 100 ballistic missile launches uh, simultaneously from anywhere on the, on the world. And that would take care of the most likely scenarios. It was not developed, it was gonna be very, very expensive. But it brings up the idea that when we look at space from a war fighting perspective, we see it not as um, an open area, an open ocean that everyone can sail upon. We see these in orbital characteristics. We see it in gravity wells, and the effect that gravity has on the ability to get from here to there. What I'm depicting here is uh, gravity as it would be in the Earth-Moon system. And that area in red that you see would be what we call low Earth orbit. It looks a lot different when you depict it like this. But the other really important thing to see here is that from the perspective of the solar system, the Earth is a single is a single place. We can launch from different areas, they launch in, uh, um, uh, from around the world, but the Earth is actually a single port. It is a uh, launch facilities, no matter where they are, can be seen as like piers in the port of New York has different docks and piers. Every single thing going into outer space has to pass through low Earth orbit. And as long ago as 1958, we were looking at the idea of if you could seed space with enough weapons, and if you were willing to use them to prevent anyone else from getting to space, you could effectively have a blockade of the Earth. 
Well, I've um, uh, just make things a little bit quicker. I'm looking at, uh, that was something I, I worked with a long time ago is what it was. And today I'm looking at uh, kinetic, ener uh, excuse me, directed energy, primarily lasers, microwaves, uh, and the like, uh, plasma bursts even as a possibility. Um, and this is because the technology of lasers have come a long, long, long way. Uh, we can build 15 kilowatt lasers from off the shelf, uh, rest of the parts we get from electronic stores. Uh, we can put them on, uh, add, attach them to an iPhone 6, put some solar panels on them, we can get these very small uh, lasers uh, into the air. And they're very, they have a tremendous capability. Uh, I'm just throwing 15 kilowatts out as just a, a general idea. Uh, because a 15 kilowatt laser with a microsecond burst can penetrate uh, nickel, uh, quarter, um, that type of metal and metal skin. And it wouldn't cause the kind of kinetic damage that would come from a blast as is, uh, as is projected by many of the, those who think there'll be a war in space and it could only be dirty, it would have to create debris. Uh, a small uh, a level of uh, laser power on solar panels could degrade those panels very quickly, making the spacecraft inoperable. It could blind the spacecraft, the spacecraft make it inoperable, or it could destroy some critical components in a burn through that would not be destructive or cause additional damage. The other great thing about lasers in space is that uh, um, anything that could be used to clean up space, in other words, take out the debris that we already have, and lasers could push small amounts of debris into, uh, into the orbit, could, uh, could be burned up or perhaps out of orbit or destroy them completely, uh, vaporizing those, those items. And that would also be great uh, practice, a sharpshooting practice for the operators. Needed. Now, the way I see this operating today, it's not great that lasers can, can threaten the surface of the Earth. Uh, I see them, uh, as I mentioned, massive uh, um, networks of satellites in low Earth orbit, very small satellites operating connected to each other. Uh, and the idea here comes from something I read about uh, in the medical field. Uh, in the medical field in the 1930s, doctors started uh, experimenting with lasers to defeat uh, cancer. In other words, a laser could send a beam uh, to, uh, to defeat cancer, and it would have the effect of destroying the cancer cells inside the body. But the problem is it would also destroy healthy cells on the way in and on the way out. For large uh, directed energy systems like the airborne laser uh, or the or large heavy ground-based lasers, you're going to burn up or destroy things in the path to the target and um, on the way out. There's a real problem with that. Now, what was happening was we were getting about a 10% survival rate from that sort of uh, effort. Uh, later on, someone said, you know, directed energy weapons are 100% additive. That means if I have uh, two 15 kilowatt lasers, I have the effect of 30 kilowatts of power. If I have 100, uh, it multiplies by 100 times. And the way you do this to kill healthy cells in the body is you have several uh, lasers all around the body, each one of them targeting the um, uh, unhealthy cells and where they intersect, these are low level lasers, but where they intersect, they can have a cell killing effect at that point at the uh, cancer cell without harming the body anywhere else. I'm imagining we can do the same sort of thing in outer space, having hundreds of small, uh, each laser not being able to do much damage at all, but several lasers being uh, targeted on a, single, on a single place, one laser painting the target, the rest of them simply uh, going after it. And we could get a tremendous warfighting capability in space. And this is also the speed of light. Um, when we look at that it, uh, in, a, in an idea like this, um, we have something also that gives an advantage from space to the Earth that is much like the gravity well advantage that you would get in, uh, in uh, targets from space and to the Earth. And by the way, yes, we know where satellites are. We know where they're going, mostly because the United States Air Force publishes that, uh, that data for the rest of the world to see. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're easy to hit. Uh, they're traveling at 17 and a half thousand miles per hour. Uh, and uh, to climb out of the gravity well and get up there creates a very big plume. But what if you use uh, a laser to attack those satellites? Well, if you're willing to attack the laser before it goes operational, maybe that would stop that. But there's a tremendous advantage that you get, and it's based on something called the shower curtain effect. Uh, if we look at a laser going from space to the ground, it has a very tight, very close beam as it goes through the vacuum, but, it's, but it, uh, um, 
but in return, a uh, let me say, uh, get back. You can see that a, a laser going from the ground to space starts to bloom in the atmosphere. It gets dispersed, and then that keeps on going in the vacuum of space. You have to have a very, very powerful laser on the Earth in order to affect the satellite with catastrophic damage. From space, however, going the other direction on the left, you keep a tight beam until you get to the atmosphere, and then it starts to bloom. You need about 10 times as much power to go from ground to space as from space to ground to get the same effect. That gets accelerated if you're not directly above the target as the bloom gets bigger as it goes out. And you can see going from the Earth to space, it gets even larger. Uh, with this idea and global satellites being um, part of the equation, you've always got a satellite with a laser at some point over the Earth. Now, it can't do a lot of damage. It's not going to any war in space wouldn't necessarily damage uh, on the ground. But it's an idea uh, that I'm playing with and having some uh, uh, interest in. I get to, uh, as a member of the, of the military, um, I need to, uh, and getting paid for for thinking about war in space, and we would be derelict in our duty if we didn't think. We don't want to go to war in space. We'd rather not have it. But if we do get a war in space, we better have been thinking about how we fight it. And so that's kind of the way we're looking at it. I've run out of time. I'm going to go ahead and call it at this point, and I'm interested in your question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dolman. Uh, now we can move on to the audience Q&A portion of the panel. Um, so, if you are an audience member, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can submit questions for me to read to all of the plant panelists or just one of them. But to start things off while people think of questions, I'll ask a general question to all three of our panelists. So space warfare in its current state involves targeting satellites rather than human soldiers. Does the lack of human targets change how actors approach space security? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start on that. Um, I think it I think it does uh, in that we've seen that there is uh, there's if you destroy property as opposed to killing people, um, that doesn't seem to generate as much of a response. Uh, we know last year when the Iranians shot down a U.S. reconnaissance drone over the Persian Gulf, um, President Trump considered airstrikes but eventually called it off. And one of the factors that seemed to weigh heavily on him and many others who didn't want to do strikes is, well, nobody died. And would we strike back at Iran in a way that would kill people? over an uncrewed vehicle being shot down. Uh, this comes up with cyber attacks as well. And there's actually been been uh, research uh, by a number of political scientists um, that find that, yeah, if you tell people, you know, how much do you want to retaliate against a cyber attack or shooting down an, an uncrewed drone, um, it just doesn't generate the same kind of response. So, you know, taking out a satellite that doesn't, that doesn't, you know, the, the notion, and uh, uh, Professor Dolman kind of alluded to this, would we really strike back in a way that would harm humans because a you know hunk of solar panels and antennas in space is destroyed um maybe not uh that both both the general public and policymakers seem hesitant about that um so that you, you know that in that sense kind of i i think there are some space relevant lessons we're learning from what we've seen with uh combat involving uh, uncrewed drones cyber etc Sorry, I, I would say that links into the idea of new deterrent thinking that we've been talking about. So when you're not uh, killing people directly, uh, it's, it's difficult to uh, have a, or threaten a punishment, a severe punishment for that. Um, one, one of the ideas that we're thinking about is um, that it might not be a chicken game when you don't have people involved. It may be more like a war of attrition. So you can get uh, the idea of a frozen conflict where the two sides are, uh, if, you, if you think of a biological metaphor, it'd be two stags that are butting each other for competition. They're not trying to kill each other, but they're fighting over something of strategic value and they keep banging and banging and banging. Uh, so one side destroys property on the other side, um, then and there's a response, a, a similar response. 
the um, the trouble is that's that's a plausible scenario, but when you have the asymmetries in space, there's going to be a temptation to have that war of attrition, to have that response in another domain. I, again, as as uh, Dr. Szymanski was was illustrating, and I I don't I haven't seen in the uh, unclassified level a whole lot of thinking about how a war of attrition would play out across several domains and how you would keep a war of attrition from turning into a much more dangerous game of chicken. Well, you know, it's an it's a, uh, uh, international law standard of recip reciprocity and proportionality. Uh, so if you're taking out someone's machine uh, to take out someone to, to respond with that with taking out more machines is proportional uh, and it highlights the problem of deterrence in war uh, as more, as the more damage you do to these satellites starts to accumulate and it has tremendous effects on both the economy and the military capacity to react. There's gonna be uh, a real uh, uh, desire or effort to start moving that into other areas where it can be uh, effective or where uh, you can use that deterrent threat of cross domain or other area. Activities. So I, I like the idea of being able to respond in space, uh, front and uh, with only into space. Uh, the other part about human targets, of course, with, without people in space, it's a lot easier, I suppose, to go to war because there is uh, just sort of an, uh, a cost utility calculation that is pretty safe and straightforward. But where we do have humans in the way, and this is the idea of UN peacekeeping uh, efforts, is uh, peace, peacekeepers don't make the peace. When a piece is uh, settled, peacekeepers are sent in to go between the two sides and, and uh, put themselves in harm's way so that if they do go back to war, there could be some deaths involved and then, they, then the states will get involved. We do the same thing with aircraft carriers when we put them in the Straits of Taiwan uh, when the Chinese are doing a military exercise where they're uh, practicing taking a large island, uh, for example. If we really wanted to defend Taiwan, we put them about 200 miles on the other side of the uh, of the of the island rather than right there in the way. They're there to be sunk in a sense. Uh, you take a, uh, you attack Taiwan and you take it, will the United States really go to war with China to, to, uh, to uh, over that? But if you sink a carrier with uh, 6,000 people on board, you bet, you bet we will. So that's the kind of ratcheting up that humans do. Now the problem with humans in space is they're really, really, really expensive to keep there. But if we're looking at kinetic weapons, blowing things up in space and causing massive amounts of debris, the International Space Station is probably the most deterring thing that we have up there at the current time. Uh, we've got uh, astronauts from all countries up there and they would be in harm's way. The US military, the Air Force would have thought in the 1950s and early 1960s that manned space bombers and manned space fighters would be the way things go. It's gonna be like drone warfare in space. It's all virtual as far as the operators are concerned. Uh, and uh, so the more people in space, and this is where commerce really comes into play. Uh, as Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and Richard Branson start doing, uh, getting more people into space, uh, just even for tourism, it becomes a lot more difficult to start having those uh, dangerous wars that cause debris that might hurt people. And so in a way they'll have a, they'll have a, a deterring effect, but history also shows that flag follows commerce. Wherever economic value and human beings have gone and that economic value gets great enough, the military is called in to protect that. The military is gonna to have to go into space to do things like search and rescue, um, removing uh, obstacles to danger, uh, weather prediction and practice and regulating and making sure that piracy is limited. Uh, piracy mostly virtual at this point, but eventually possibly physical. Uh, and whether the military wants to go in or not is a moot point. Uh, it'll be a call from, from all the people that may be going in there and all the value that we are getting out of it. Can I have another attack? Because I, um, Professor Dolman made me think of something. It's um, putting people in the way is related to uh, Dr. Burbach's dual use slide. So remember when he was talking about the commercial and the military? So one of the layers in, in this idea of layered deterrence is this notion of entanglement, that uh, if you can't put people in the way, it's not convenient to do that. You can perhaps put commercial technology in the way, or you can entangle commercial and military technology so that when your, your asset is destroyed, when the property is destroyed, there are a number of private concerns across the world that care about that. Well, let me take one attack on that, uh, Damon. Um, uh, if you do that, you put military uh, capabilities on civilian satellites, you, you technically make them a legitimate target. 
I, I, don't, I, I don't disagree that that helps in deterrence, but that's one of the problems. Right, but I'm saying I'm saying not necessarily that. It could be that, but just just having um, military use of commercial technology, just the dual use technology there. Um, if if they are going after one of those dual assets, then they're they're entangled. So you could design your military infrastructure so that it was further entangled, so that that asset now, when it's when it's uh, disabled, it's affecting commercial entities around the world and not just the military. So I wasn't thinking about um, uh, aircraft carriers so much as a uh, communication satellite that had dual use. Thanks for your uh, responses. Uh, we're starting to get a few audience questions coming in. So uh, I'll pick one of those and hopefully we'll hear your answers and feedback. Um, so one audience member says, this one's a long one, international cooperation in space seems to be at an all time high right now. When you look at the ISS, Artemis, Lunar Gateway and plans to go on to Mars. All of this is heavily dependent on cooperation as NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine repeatedly explains. Why emphasize your realist security dilemma approach so much when you could instead be focused on the opportunities for international cooperation? Couldn't the US military end up actually sparking the security dilemma itself? Uh, sure, let, let me take that. And I, I would even lump in the, uh, the, the uh, previous question, why is it difficult to practice that uh, restraint that we saw during the Cold War, kind of in a related note. Uh, several things there. The uh, uh, looks like uh, Maya, if I uh, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is correct. There is actually a lot of space diplomacy going on now, too. The, the Artemis Accords uh, is a set of diplomatic agreements that NASA and the State Department are trying to negotiate with other countries on how we would do moon exploration together. Um, so they're really, that's absolutely true. Um, it's a somewhat separate track than the security lane. And one thing that is important to note about that, uh, that diplomacy, uh, is China and Russia are not involved. And in fact, uh, you know, we, we, NASA specifically is prohibited from trying, from cooperating with China at all to the point that you can't even have a Chinese scientist visit a NASA facility. Um, and we're, so we're actually not involving them in the those uh, Artemis Accords. Russia also has not really wanted to be involved and has kind of grumbled, you know, raised some objections to how we're thinking of doing the moon exploration. Um, so we're, we sort of have a, a parallel track of civilian space diplomacy um, at the same time that, that on the military side, we are raising these concerns. Um, I, I don't think that security dilemma, well, the, the dilemma is somewhat inevitable in the sense that it's such an offensive dominant and so dual use, it's hard to get away from that. I would like, I hope that we are able to show some restraint. Now, if you look at the Cold War, although we we kept ending up back showing some relative restraint and I, if if Paul Szymanski were here he he may you know he 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 may know about some secret ways that we didn't show restraint that I'm not familiar with um but it certainly could have been worse but we kept as with the strategic defense initiative the the Star Wars missile defense that uh, ever just told you about we never the military you know militaries aren't comfortable being in that position of we have to accept mutual vulnerability. I mean, militaries want to be able to say, we are able to prevent this from happening. We're able to be invulnerable. And since the end of the Cold War, we've been in a position where we haven't really faced a lot of space threats in a serious way. And I think we, we're now seeing those threats evolving and are going through an initial phase of, well, how do we absolutely guarantee that we keep space access and adversaries don't? I think that's going to be very hard to achieve, and and I think maybe you know I hope I think we probably you know a good outcome would be that we get to some tacit or even more formal restraint, perhaps some agreements. It's hard to verify arms control agreements in space because you know as as Szymanski explained, it's hard to see exactly what's going on up there. Um, so I I hope we are able to get out of out of this dilemma because I, I think the goal of we're invulnerable and no other peer peer powers cannot access space. I think that's a really difficult goal to get to. And so I, I, I would like to see us avoid kind of the spiraling arms race uh, 
end point of the security dilemma and instead seek some some diplomatic ways uh, or even if it's informal to avoid the worst competition Um, well, I'll take a, a stab at that. I, I understand your concerns about realism. It's something that, I, that we deal with all the time. Uh, uh, the idea that comes from uh, strength through peace, uh, peace through strength is the old Roman adage, uh, civic pacem parabellum, uh, if you want peace, prepare for war. And that is a problem. If you're preparing for war all the time, you're probably going to get it. And I, I understand that. The other thing is, though, the, the, the military tends to be pretty conservative when it comes to actually wanting to go to war uh, because they're the ones who suffer the, the, the hardships of it the most in their families. But we don't make the decision to go to war. Uh, we, we prepare and we plan, and if called upon, then we go to war. So international cooperation, except international cooperation with other militaries, is really not in the purview uh, of what we do. We're sort of at the limit. But um, we do can do, we can influence it by understanding that debris is a common enemy, uh, planetary defense, comets, asteroids are a common enemy, and the ability to, to deny that, uh, it, to clean it up, to stop it, uh, generally is going to fall to the military. The military is going to be doing other things like search and rescue, which causes uh, potential for a lot of international cooperation. Uh, when the Outer Space Treaty was first being negotiated in the early, well, in 1959 to 1960, as early as that, uh, the hope was that we would get a United Nations space force or the police force for the world that could be operated by all nations, who, uh, whether uh, regardless of their, their ability to actually participate in that, uh, much in keeping with the uh, idea of the Outer Space Treaty. It's problematic because of the realist notion that, uh, sure, I, uh, I like it, but not, I'm not going to put my forces under anyone else's command, and it just sort of falls apart. We're, as long as we're going out into space uh, as nation states, and uh, the Outer Space Treaty requires that uh, almost uh, in a sense because it says nation states are responsible for all damages uh, in space. It's gonna be tough, uh, but we can, we can uh, look at it uh, from a diplomatic and from an economic uh, way. And if uh, we go in that direction, the army will, uh, the military, the Space Force will be told to uh, um, you know, just keep, keep planning, but don't, don't deploy, don't uh, test. And that's, that's not up to, not to my boss. And I guess I can afford to be uh, a little more optimistic because I'm at the, the pre-commissioning level. And uh, part of the professionalization of the Space Force will be how we educate um, college age students who are going to be going into the Space Force or working with the Space Force. And the, the journal, the, the Space and Defense Journal um, tries to take a political economy approach and when you, when you think about a political economy, you think about mixed gains, potential for cooperation as well as conflict. And that's where that second point came from, the idea that public goods and your question about international cooperation, the possibilities for cooperation are rising at the same time uh, as great power competition. Um, what Dr. Brubach said, I think is relevant. If you, if you try to go back to the Cold War and, and uh, build historical analogies. I think what helped the military be involved in arms control and provide professional advice about arms control was the mutual vulnerability. So it was a, a recognition of uh, mutual assured destruction. You don't have that right now in space. So it, it does make it very difficult. In fact, based on what I'm reading at the unclassified level, I would estimate that there's asymmetric vulnerability. So we're actually more vulnerable because we're more reliant. And this is a offense dominant environment. And so it's very difficult then for the military to sign off on uh, cooperation. So you, you see that when uh, Russia and China put proposals uh, on the table in the United Nations, there's a real reluctance to say, well, how are we going to verify this? How are we going to be better off with this treaty uh, than without it? Um, and uh, one, one chilling idea to think about is that we may have to go to a point where uh, there, there is a crisis and there's a real concern and there's a mutual recognition of danger before we can put those uh, cooperative measures in place, like as we saw with the SALT treaties during the Cold War. Uh, one, one way where we might not have to go there that's, that's more optimistic is, again, that there, 
that um, our adversaries, which are involved in cooperation as well as competition with us, see real value in the public goods that the United States is providing. And so they're just a little more reluctant to destroy US assets because they don't wanna lose the public goods. They don't wanna lose the services that the United States is providing. Um, it may be a while before other countries start to think in those terms. In fact, in, in some ways they're moving away in that even our allies, the uh, the Europeans built their own navigational constellation, uh, not wanting to be completely dependent on US GPS. Uh, they built their Galileo network. Uh, Russia has GLONASS, China has uh, now has Baidu. Um, uh, uh, one bit of good news is everybody, th these systems are mostly compatible. So the, the advantage you all have is your cell phones and your cars can now rely on a bunch of different country satellites. Um, but every, you know, even the Europeans didn't want to be in a position where if the U.S. system was turned off or was destroyed, um, I mean, a situation where somebody wants to take away U.S. GPS and not European Galileo, I'm not entirely sure what that would be. But, uh, you know, one, one of the thing, you know, one general point, you know, any, any great power, I mean, in general, great powers like to be autonomous. And we absolutely see that in space where, you know, what China has been doing has been kind of building out those, ba those space capabilities. Uh, so that it has its own navigation, its own weather satellites, its own communication satellites. Um, you know, the U.S. provides a lot of public goods. I mean, we've still got, you know, we, we do provide GPS. We've got, you know, the best weather data. But countries countries don't like to, you know, w what we see is as countries become capable, they want their own national capabilities uh, and don't like to rely on, on U.S. public goods. Okay, so I think we have time for potentially one more question. So another attendee asked, uh, does the US, both government and industry, still have a technological advantage in the space domain over China? How are those trend lines changing? Uh, I'll, I've studied the Chinese program a bit, so I'll, uh, I'll go. In fact, I just did a, if any of you want to look up, there's a, a podcast called Cosmic Controversies uh, that Forbes puts out. I was just a, a guest on that discussing the Chinese space program. Uh, bottom line is no, China does not have a technological advantage, um, either in government or industry. Um, one thing worth noting is uh, in you, in, if you follow space at all, you're probably aware of SpaceX. The, SpaceX has absolutely eaten the Chinese. Chinese space programs lunch when it comes to the global market for launching satellites. Uh, SpaceX is able to do more for less money. Uh, and when it comes to technology, uh, I mean, the uh, Air Force Secretary uh, Barrett noted that, you know, expressed some, you know, said that the Chinese little rover they have on the moon right now is ominous. Um, eh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not so worried about that. I mean, that what they have on the moon right now is the equivalent of the uh, Pathfinder rover that we put on Mars 25 years ago. Um, in general, Chinese technology, it, it's, you know, I would, nobody who really knows space would trade what China has for what we have. What is relevant and this is where that offense dominance comes in, is if China is merely a strong number two, that's still enough to threaten us. Um, in a military sense, they also are not as dependent upon space, especially if we were fighting, you know, if China wanted to try and, you know, fight a war in the Gulf of Mexico, they would need a lot of space assets that they don't have and they went that we could threaten. If we are fighting over Taiwan, we're more dependent upon the capabilities that space gives you to fight far away across a big ocean. So I think a better way to think of China is they have moved into the number two position um, and they want the world. To, I mean, China has no pretensions that that they're better than the U.S. in space, but they would like the world to think that they're better than certainly better than the Indians or the Japanese, better than the Russians, you know, better than the Europeans. So, you know, think of China as a strong number two, but we're we're still ahead. But merely being ahead doesn't necessarily guarantee space safety. And another reason why it doesn't guarantee it is because it's hard to stay ahead. So sometimes it's cheaper to be the follower than the leader. And the other, the other thing is, is that um, just because you're ahead in many things, even the most important things, 
doesn't mean that you're ahead in everything that matters. So if you go back to a historical analogy, uh, the Japanese made some progress that we didn't anticipate and you got Pearl Harbor. So I'm not saying that there's gonna be a space Pearl Harbor. I'm just saying that technological leads are not safe uh, in any case, particularly if you have a strong number two, who seems to be a pretty proficient follower. Well, time will tell, that's for sure. Um, the, uh, we have this with the Russians and it's, it's interesting. Uh, they, they were preparing for a military space program, a war in space. We were preparing uh, for probably not having a war in space. And we both had command economies at the time. And the reason was we didn't want people launching uh, rockets from their backyard or from someplace deep in Texas uh, because it might look like a nuclear strike and we didn't want to start a nuclear war. That's why we don't really get licensing for private space companies uh, until the mid 1990s and, and beyond uh, because again, the, the state is responsible for all actors within its borders. Uh, but we've got now, we've unleashed a free market economy uh, onto space um, and uh, the dot-com billionaires have taken up on it and they are making extraordinary strides. Command economies are terrific to get exactly what you want in the short term. That's why we go to it in the wartime. Uh, but as long as peace continues on, I'm not so sure I think the fast follower is as, as useful as it is for, in, for wartime. Uh, but as long as peace continues and as long as we can deter and it looks like, uh, if not deter, at least cooperate, uh, the, the greater the advantage that are gonna come from that free market system coming up with all sorts of different ideas. Uh, and that also will bring in uh, some other issues. One problem though, and nothing comes, nothing good comes without, without problems. Uh, the question that, that, that I worry about is how much of our national security should we rely on business for? And uh, making war a business is never a good idea. Uh, so it's while we're gaining advantages in technology and other areas that I think are gonna be extraordinarily useful. Uh, the military is looking at those uh, those technology advantages, see how they can adapt to to uh, military needs and uses. Um, and I sure hate to start paying uh, paying for private business to do our national security anywhere, including space. At least not more than we're already doing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more quick question. Uh, Another attendee asked, uh, what does the ladder of escalation look like in space warfare? I think you're gonna have some disagreement on this panel because they're still trying to figure that out. Um, we don't know what the ladder looks like in limited nuclear warfare in the second nuclear age. And we don't know what it looks like in space. And um, Professor Dolman was talking about, we might have a better sense of it if we had more options to stay in space. Uh, what we're seeing at the journal, again, this is at the unclassified level, is that um, that's, uh, at least today, that's not the way they believe it would happen. They think that it would cross domains, and there isn't a lot of uh, evidence that we have, a lot of data that we can rely on to, to see how that would go. Um, my, my sense is that there would be reluctance on the part of the great powers, since they all have nuclear arsenals to, there would be a real reluctance to shoot up that ladder very quickly. And that uh, I think that there should be more thinking at, at my level, at the, uh, at the uh, undergraduate and, and first year graduate level, but also where they're doing the real exercises, the detailed exercise at the classified level, there should be more thinking about what a war of attrition would look like. And that's not exactly a ladder, but that's a long-term competition over something of strategic value. And how do you, how do you maintain yourself in that um, uh, if you don't escalate? That, that could also, you could have a, um, strategic defeats or defeats of strategic significance without ever going up the ladder. So I think, I think we need to think about the problem that your questioner puts on the table, but I'm also worried about this idea of a war of attrition that goes across domains. Uh, I will, you know, it's, uh, I, I would agree that I don't, I don't think we have a clear sense of this yet. And one complication to, to go back to something Paul Szymanski said is that in some ways space is, is a little less like, you know, uh, Air, you know, physical airstrikes and more like cyber or more like counterintelligence in that a lot of stuff can happen secretly. And we, you know, we, we, we've acknowledged in the U.S. 
Uh, we have a syst- you know, we have uh, at least one system designed for jamming enemy satellites. Uh, it's you know, we know the Russians have such systems, cyber attacks, uh, or even you know, if you have quietly have a you know little satellite come up on a satellite and disable it, as, as Paul noted. Uh, from my perspective, did an adversary just destroy my satellite, or did it just fail because something broke? And I I think we you know there we're likely to to see a lot of you know either transient interference jamming cyber attacks or fairly secret attacks um which on the one hand can help slow escalation because there isn't necessarily a big public oh my god the other side attacked us on the other hand it could lead to problems of false you know you know we we also need to be careful we don't accidentally you know, conclude there was an attack when a satellite happens to break in the middle of a crisis just because of bad luck. Uh, so I, I but I think it's important to recognize there is sort of that, you know, secret, quiet, counter, you know, intel, counter intel angle, as opposed to sort of, you know, you bombed me. So now I'll, you know, I'll drop two bombs on you in response. It's It's probably a lot more covert and uncertain than a lot of what we're used to terrestrially. Could I, before Professor Dolman goes, I, I, could I get in one more thing? And it, it ties to the third bullet that I laid out on the table, which is uh, civil military relations in the Space Force. Um, I, I think personally, I, I don't know that there's a lot of uh, back, background to this, but I guess there's a little bit. The General Raymond's talked a little, little bit about this. But I think that the Space Force is going to have to get awfully good at gaming. And, and and games to try to try to get a sense of what that escalation ladder looks like or what that war of attrition looks like. And um, part of professionalization is figuring out education. I think the education, the professional education of the Space Force is going to be different. And I think it's going to use uh, gaming. And the question is, do we know how to use gaming very well at that level? Professor Dolman, I'm sorry about that. Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, there's uh... The escalation ladder that I wrote about 20 years ago was to secretly seek space, take over low Earth orbit, and it's a fait accompli. And I think that's sort of the, uh, the uh, holy grail of escalation for space to just get it over with. Uh, the problem is that was never realistic back then, and it's not realistic today as more competition has come in. The big thing that a lot of folks seem to be worrying about is to, if we can keep war out of space, then it won't filter down uh, onto the terrest- terrestrial sphere. Um, the problem is that's not a one-way arrow. Every war on the terrestrial sphere has gone up into space. So the escalation ladder uh, for space is going to look an awful lot like the one on the ground because that's probably where it'll kick off. We are uh, unfortunately out of time, but again, I would like to just finish up this panel by Again, thanking our panelists, Dr. Burback, Dr. Coletta, and Dr. Dolman for uh, donating their time to speak to us today and also answer our questions. Um, and thank you all in the audience for coming and listening. Um, our next panel is at 1.30 p.m. Uh, and it'll be regarding the US Space Force. So we look forward to seeing you there. <laughs>